All right, got my favorite knife and I've got two Dells. And I wanna see how long it's gonna take me to figure out which one of these is the X Elite variety and which one of these is the Intel variety. Now this video is split up into multiple parts so you can check out what you need. I'm gonna do the unboxing first and my initial impressions. And then I'll get into some of my software developer testing. You can find the chapters down below. Looks like they both have the fun little opener. I don't need my knife, I'm sad. Okay, XPS. Now Dell has always been my second favorite machine. Oh, oh, it's another box. That's the shipping box and this is the actual box. That's pretty cool looking. I gotta admit that I've never tried the 13. I've only tried the 15s. And the 15 has been um, pretty nice. I always liked the 15. I've had videos on the channel where I show unboxings and set up for developers. All right, here's the other one. They look, <laughs> they look identical. It's good reuse of packaging, I suppose. There's the XPS. I've been hearing some nasty rumors about the 13s, but still I wanted to check it out, especially because now we've got some comparisons to do with the processors. One of these is X Elite and one of these is Intel. Let's see. Welcome to Dell, let's get things going together, okay? This thing is cute. This has gotta be the smallest laptop I have. It's very solid. In the box we've got power cable, USB-C cable for power, instructions and the power converter. Pretty simple stuff. It doesn't seem like you get an extra dongle like you would with the XPS 15. Seriously, this thing is tiny. This is the MacBook Air and this is the XPS 13 in front of it. You got a half an inch it's about as big as the MacBook 12 inch. Are you sure, Dell, that this is 13 inches? Here's the 12 inch MacBook. It's the same size, but they do have a little bit more on the end there. Next machine. They are different colors, and I don't remember which colors I ordered for which model, so yeah, we shall see. So the packaging is the same, the instructions are the same, the power cables and transformer are the same. All right, here they are. Let's look inside to see if there's any ugly stickers in there. They really gotta stop doing that. Is it a one finger open? Not really, the whole thing slides. Oh, two fingers open. They did, they put stickers on it. Now I know which one is which. This is very weird. The keys seem oddly large. Other than that, the keyboard is exactly the same on both of these, and they both have the Copilot key. All right, let's turn it on. In case you missed it, the dark one is Snapdragon X Elite. And <laughs> every time I get a machine with the stickers, it's always tilted. Why can't they put the sticker on straight? It's not that hard. Guess they're in a big hurry. All right, let's, what's going on here? Let's turn this on. Gotta hold this down for a little bit, I guess. No? Maybe I do gotta plug it in. Each one of these laptops has one USB-C port per side. That's good. I've actually wanted that kind of split. Let's power that on. XPS, XPS, looking pretty good. The, uh, the function row is pretty annoying. They're lit up keys instead of actual keys. They're not physical keys. This machine started up first, the X Elite. Now the Intel version has these specs right here. It is the Intel Evo edition. The Snapdragon X Elite version has these specs right over here. Oh, I don't know where to touch. This this whole thing is the trackpad. Is, is the whole thing a trackpad? No, not the whole thing. It just starts over here between the Copilot and the Alt key, and over here between the Alt key and the space bar. So right here is your touch surface. Oh, that is weird. You don't know where it is really. And the same thing over here. So you have to kind of guess. There's no tactile feedback when you reached the end of the trackpad. You kind of have to guess or memorize it or position yourself in a certain way. Now let us pretend that these stickers weren't here. What would be the next thing that would be a dead giveaway? That one of these is an R machine and one of these is an X64 machine. Let's keep going and find out. I like the keys, I like their springiness. Uh, they're the most Mac-like that I've felt. However, the weirdness here is that there's no spacing between the keys and they're all kind of flush. So that's very strange. Check out what your new Copilot Plus PC is capable of while you wait. And this is the first indication of the fact that this is an X Elite machine, whereas this one does not show me that screen. Let's quickly check the temperature here. On this machine, we're at 31 degrees and on this machine, we're at 
37 degrees. Wow. Already? So both of these computers are not sitting flush in the same exact way. And my desk is straight. Okay, it's fine. If I press on the left side of these machines, that's sitting on the desk. But the right corner is not. Same hardware design flaw in both of these. I can actually see it. I don't know if I can show it to you, but yes. That is not quality workmanship, Dell. I had to try this on some other desks and the problem is the same. Here's a surface and most laptops are designed with four little rubber pips, just like that. Now three would be ideal to avoid rocking, but four is better for stability. And when you put four feet down on a table like that, it's gonna be pretty level. What Dell does though is instead of four feet, they do these rubber lines. And I guess they sort of expect the lines to wear out as you use the machine. I've had this unboxed for a couple of days now and you can see the foot is starting to wear out a bit, but it's still not sitting quite level. Dell, this design is terrible. Please get rid of these strips back here. As a side story, my wife uses a Dell for her work and every six months or so, she comes to me with a problem where these strips stretch out too far and I have to surgically cut them down and glue them back in. Come on, Dell. So I've been using GitHub Copilot for the last couple years and it's been okay, but time passes and better things come out. I recently tried Super Maven and it kind of blew me away. Why? Well, first off, Super Maven is extremely fast and it has a 1 million token context window. That means it can see about 100,000 lines of your code. And if it understands more your projects, it can offer better suggestions. It's got chat, it's got fixes, it's got suggestions, and it lets you choose between some of the most popular coding LLMs out there right now. And it also runs its own proprietary model that's optimized for coding, which ensures the fastest completions out there. You might also be concerned with code security and I don't blame you. They don't share your code and they don't train on your code. So try Super Maven today. There's NeoVim, JetBrains and VS Code extensions. There's a link in the description. All right, it's been a few days. Uh, I'm wearing the same shirt, so there's continuity, okay? I just broke the continuity. Anyway, the Dells now have some software developer tools on it. I have already done the battery test with a bunch of X Elite machines, including these um, and the Dells. And I will link to that video down below if you wanna check it out. I also did a longer video for the full developer setup on these machines on the Windows for ARM machines. Link in the description. Let's start from scratch and power these on to see which one is faster. One, two, three, go. So far, the Snapdragon one feels a little bit more snappy but the intel one actually gave me the screen first the login screen by a couple of seconds now let's get into windows that was very quick on both i don't think i'm gonna get used to this touchpad especially right clicking you never know quite where to place your fingers also there is no hard function keys it's pretty much a non-starter for me but if you're one of the people that enjoyed the max touch bar then maybe you'll enjoy these fake keys the most frustrating thing was when I have to push the function key, I have to hold down the function button. There's probably a setting that I can change to have that be the default. But then when you do that, the escape key and the delete key stay. These turn into function buttons, but then you don't have insert and home and all these other functions. Just kind of have to live with it. Let's start up VS Code. Let's go. That was pretty much the same. Let's do Chrome. Chrome popped up. Pretty much the same time. I can't really spot the difference. Let's try Visual Studio. Start that up. Oh, the ARM version of Visual Studio is very nicely optimized. I've made videos about that before, how well Microsoft has handled that. Let's create a new project here. Boom. Yeah, the ARM version of Visual Studio is very sleek. It's much faster. Blazor Web App, next. Next, we are gonna do HTTPS, and I wanna show you something else. This is gonna be funny. Um, <laughs> the ARM version doesn't warn you that this is gonna require SQL Server if you do authentication type to individual accounts. Now, normally, when you're creating a Blazor project and you, or any ASP.NET uh, project, you would have the option, do you want authentication or not? If you do, it's gonna create a local SQL Server instance and spin that up every time you debug or run the program. Well, SQL Server doesn't work on ARM. Let's see what happens. I created the project. Which one of them is gonna be popping up first? Ha, ah, too close, too close. And now I'm going to run it. Boom. 
Now this one is currently building for ARM and this one is building for x64. You can target each of the platforms separately, of course. You can target x64 on this one. You can target ARM on this one. Now here I got the SSL warning. I'm gonna say yes, yes, and yes, and yes. Okay, let's see. Yeah, noticeably faster on the ARM version. <laughs> We're already browsing the website. There it is, counter. That all works. Let's go with uh, register because, you know, auth is required. Email Schwarzenegger at gmail.com. Arnold, that's easier, at gmail.com. Let's go with uh, register. Here we go. A database operation failed while processing the request on the Intel one? Okay, okay. It's using entity framework behind the scenes and I didn't set that up. So this is actually a good thing. It's asking me to apply the migrations, which I will do, and then it's going to be ready. This is basically setting up the database and the schema for your user accounts. Now it says try refreshing the page, which I will do register confirmation because it's not actually sending the email you have to click this to confirm your account now if we go to log in and log in hey look at that i'm logged in and there's my username right there now what's going on here with our x elite machine well it's a very different error here an unhandled exception occurred while processing the request sql exception Win32 exception, this is not a valid Win32 application. No, it's not. It's an ARM-based application. So what's happening here is there is a SQL Server Express instance running in the background. If you build for x64, you can actually use that. But if you build for ARM, your web app is running in a process that's ARM-based and your SQL Server is running in a process that's not, and they can't talk to each other not unless there's some kind of a layer that Microsoft creates to handle the situation. So if you're going to be developing on an ARM-based machine like this, you're going to want to talk to an external database somewhere else. You can also change target instead of ARM x64 and build for that, but then you're going to run into other issues like with translation and slowness. Why would you want to do that to yourself? Don't. Just use an external database. For those of you working with Visual Studio, I've pointed this out before, but we can clearly see the difference here. Visual Studio for ARM has these workloads, ASP.NET, Node, so there's two web and cloud, four desktop and mobile, and two gaming and two others. There's quite a bit more here on the Intel version for web and cloud, including Python and Azure, five desktop and mobile, two gaming and five others, including SharePoint, data science and data storage stuff. Now, I also wanted to set up Android Studio to test out Android development. And when you go to um, Android Studio download page, you get this. Note, Windows machines with ARM-based CPUs aren't currently supported. Come on, that's too bad. So we're gonna try the x64 version of Android Studio and see how that goes. I'm going through the Android Studio installation process and so far it seems fine. I've also kicked off a bunch of other programs that I normally use and I have open day to day just to kind of simulate a more realistic environment here. And when I turn these on, it started at 100% battery, both of them. So we're gonna see how all this affects the battery. I have a separate battery test coming up in another video coming soon, so make sure you don't miss that. Now, if we take a look at the x Elite machine, You'll see that I have a bunch of x64 processes running now. Uh, I do have a bunch of ARM ones, of course. Those are the default ones, code, Chrome, all the Dell stuff, uh, a bunch of stuff on there. But I have a few x64 ones like Android Studio, uh, Notion, SQL Writer was the thing that I talked to you about when we did the uh, Visual Studio test. It's funny because I have Todoist and Notion installed on these, and they're both Electron-based apps. Well, Todoist was already built for ARM, but Notion is a little bit behind. Notion is all on x64 right now. All right, Android Studio finished installing. So now that we know we have the same version, the x64 version running on both of these machines, one is gonna be going through translation. If I pop these open at the same time, we'll be able to tell how much slower this one is gonna be. So let's take a look at that. I've closed Android Studio and let's kick it off. All right, this one is already showing the graphic and it's on. This one is still thinking about it and it's gonna think about it a little bit more and um, it's still still considering opening. Maybe it'll open soon. Maybe it's thinking, oh, there it is, okay. I was gonna keep going, but it, it opened eventually. New project, let's go with empty activity. Next, next, 
Now, you can probably guess where this is headed. There might be an ARM version of the Android emulator, but I don't think it's going to be installed by default with the X64 version of Android Studio. So far, the experience of Android Studio on the X Elite machine is much slower. It's not fast to begin with, right? Android Studio is kind of like the bane of the Android developer, but this one doesn't make it any more fun. You know what else is funny? The Intel machine is making noise. This one's probably doing more work right now because it has to translate Android Studio and it's making less noise than the Intel machine. Since there's some fan noise going on, I figured there's probably a temperature difference. Let's take a look. 33 degrees. Nice and cool on the X Elite machine. Not bad. Intel machine is at 36. All right, that took a while. This thing was doing the Gradle build for a long time, but now they're both ready. I just want to kick things off. It's using the Pixel Fold API 35. It's most likely not an ARM version because ARM versions, well, they're not supported yet. So let's click run on this and see what happens here. If it even runs at all. Do you want to allow public and private networks to access this app? I want to wait for this one to catch up. You know, this one says it's 12.19 p.m. This one says 12.18 p.m. No wonder this one's faster. It's in the future. <laughs> Those clocks are supposed to be synchronized. I don't know why they're not. Hold it, hold it. I think we've come to an end. So after a while, now it's 12.21. So it's been like over two minutes, three minutes that I've been waiting for this. And it says, error running app. Your CPU does not support hardware accelerated virtualization. Hmm, so you can use a physical device or you can use a Windows or Mac device with an Intel processor or develop on a Linux computer that supports VTX or SVM or use an Android virtual device based on an ARM system image. This is 10 times slower than hardware accelerated virtualization. Since I've had such a bad experience so far with X64 apps that are translated like Android Studio, does that mean that all apps that are gonna be translated are gonna be bad? Well, not really. Yeah. Generally, when you're using an app like Notion, for example, for note taking, you don't even notice it because, well, it works fine. It is running an X64 process, it's being translated, but it's not doing anything intense. Same thing with Chrome, when you're browsing the web, and I tried Chrome uh, X64 version on this as well, you don't really notice it. Benchmarks say otherwise. You might've seen that in my performance video, but uh, you don't notice it when you're using it slowly like a human would, and you're not doing any kind of compilations. So what would happen if you run some native code? Uh, for example, Python code, like a really intense Python process, like uh, the Mandel broadcast, which ends up using all the CPU cores all at the same time and I've shown that on the channel before. Let's try that. This is gonna be native. Python for ARM, Python for x64. Let's go. Now I've set this up just like the code instructions in Benchmarks Game website say, uh, using the parameter 16,000, so it's gonna take a little bit of time. And I have the exact same thing on both of these. One, two, three, go. Okay, that's really, that's bizarre. Why is this one so slow? I'm just, I'm really curious about this. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take a peek at Task Manager to see what's going on in there. And indeed, Python is running ARM64. It just seemed like a really slow start, but let's see what the results say. Wow, okay, this one finished first. Uh, <laughs> and this one is still going. Okay, now it's done. I'm gonna run that one more time just to make sure there was no weirdness going on with the initialization of Python. I'm also gonna be using measure command here and wrap the Python call in that so that we can get the timing. All right, one, two, three, and go. I pressed that at the same time, I swear. I did. Okay, we've got a result. The Intel machine finished that in 80.7 seconds and the ARM machine finished that in 122.4 seconds. That is odd and pretty unexpected. And before you ask me, yes, they're both set to high performance power plan. Uh, so that's not the problem here. I've made sure that those are the same. If you know what's going on, let me know in the comments down below. And if you're curious about specifically which models these are, I'll have them in the description as well. Now, I know some of you have been asking about WSL2 and WSL2 works fine on this machine, but we're gonna do this same test, this Python test under WSL2 now, all in Linux. So we can use the time command, which is really handy. 
I got them both set up with the Conda environment. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I have a video on how to set up a Conda environment. And let's go. <laughs> wow. Okay. I already noticed a difference in the beginning of this. This one just started spitting out all this data and this one is, well, it took a little while to spit out the data, but I think it's a little slower. Well, we got our result on the Intel machine. It finished and it actually was faster inside WSL executing this Python code than in Windows and PowerShell. One minute and eight seconds. And the ARM machine is, uh, it's, it's not done yet. Um, let's, let's see. Okay, all right. One minute and 52 seconds on the Exley Dell XPS 13. All right, let's move on. I have this. This is a Thunderbolt enclosure and it's got a one terabyte SSD inside. So let's see if plugging this in is gonna give us, well, anything. As you may or may not know, the ports on the new breed of Copilot PCs don't support Thunderbolt. So I'm not expecting to see much here. Let's plug that in. It lives. I can access all my files on this drive. Well, that's handy. The enclosure has a controller on it that must be backwards compatible with USB. So that's pretty good. There's your sequential and random read and write times and the ARM machine and the Intel machine seem to have a very similar SSD on board. Why wouldn't they? The random numbers here are quite a bit higher actually on both the read and write than on the Intel machine. I'm uh, not sure why that is. This is the speed test of the external drive. That write speed is not great. Now, these ports don't say they're Thunderbolt on the website, and they're not. They're actually USB 4, but they are supposed to support 40 gigabit speeds. Right here, it says two USB type C full function ports. They don't mention what <laughs> USB standard. They just mentioned 40 gigabits per second. They don't mention Thunderbolt because, well, it's not, it's USB 4. It's gotta be because that's what 40 gigabits is. But if we take a look at the Intel version, now we see two Thunderbolt 4 ports. So let's test the Intel version. Will it be faster? This time we're seeing quite a bit of difference testing the external drive on the Intel based machine. And we've got quite a bit more on the read sequential here. The other numbers are all very close. Now I also happen to have a couple of monitors sitting at my desk here. Let's plug them in. We'll go one at a time. Nice. That popped up right away. Let's do the other one. Yes. So both of these are going from USB-C to display port. And as you can see, I've got both of them running now. I am noticing a bit of a lag, in my trackpad movement. Let's see how it is switching apps. App switching is still pretty good, but this trackpad has always been a little bit weird. Otherwise, it looks good. And if this one worked, I'm pretty sure that our Intel version will work as well. Let's see. There we go, there's one and there's two. Now what about that trackpad? First, let's see. Yes, the trackpad is feeling very different here now. Now what about this one? There is a delay. There is some kind of weird lag on both of these machines when there's two monitors plugged in. Very odd. Now let's have a check of the battery, shall we? The uh, x -Elite machine has 68% left. That's pretty good. The Intel based machine has 44% left. And I did the exact same thing on both of these machines. They started at 100. I also wanna mention that the Intel based machine was $100 more than this one for the same specs, 16 gigs of RAM and 512 SSD. Now the base spec here is eight gigs of RAM, whereas the X Elite machine, the base spec is 16. So they, they start out at 12.99 as the price, both of them. But if you want your Intel based machine to have 16 gigs of RAM, you gotta add that hundred bucks. Hey, everybody's doing it, except if it was Apple, it'd be $200, but you get the idea. Everybody's soldering their RAM, everybody's catching on, charging too much for RAM. That's just the world we live in now. Anyway, if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. I've got more tests coming up with a bunch of other machines. I've got so many machines to check. That's an Aphex Twin reference for those of you that are fans. That's a lot of weight. Uh, if you missed my developer setup on the new ARM-based Windows machines, check it out right over here. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.